What is the biblical definition of something which is unclean? Well, the unclean animals obviously were unclean for ceremonial reasons, but I believe there are scientific reasons why they should also be unfit for human consumption. For example, if we look at the long list of animals listed there, most of those that are unclean fall into the category of what we would call carnivores or scavengers. Now, these animals accumulate more toxins than those that are closer to the base diet, which would be plant foods. So the lowest trophic level, the lowest feeding level in any ecological system would be the plants. Mm -hmm. Now, those that are specifically listed as clean would be those that have the cloven hoof and that chew the cud. And these animals are all herbivores. And they chew the cud. That means they regurgitate what they have eaten and chew it again. But uh, the biblical version of chewing the cud is wider than the scientific one that is used in, in science today, in zoology, for well, example. Well, h explain that to us. Well, if you take an animal that chews the cud, scientifically, it would be an animal with a rumen. A cow and uh, all the ungulates and sheep and goats, they have a pre-stomach, which is called the rumen, in which bacterial fermentation takes place. So when the animals eat the grasses or the leaves that are high in cellulose, they are unable to digest these without the bacteria. So the bacteria produce enzymes like cellulase, and these digest the cellulose and make it available to the animals. Plus, the bacteria also, because they are living organisms, produce their own proteins and so augment the protein component of these animals' diets. And these nutrients pass straight through the intestine and are then discarded. And those animals are regarded as clean. They eat from the very lowest trophic level. They have the least accumulation of toxins if they stick to that particular regime. Well, how do you define dividing the hoof? Well, this is an interesting analogy. You see, some animals actually have a rumen, but they don't have a divided hoof. For example, uh, the camel. The camel has a broad-based foot, which is somewhat different to an ungulate, but it mm -hmm. has a rumen. So scientifically, one would imagine that the camel is eating just like the cow is eating, and it has a rumen, so it does the same things. But the camel is adapted to a new situation which probably didn't exist prior to the fall, and that is that it's adapted to desert environments. And as such, it has developed abilities to conserve water, and it can actually retain urea. And urea is, in these creatures is actually recycled straight back to the rumen where they are converted into proteins by the bacteria again. But the levels of toxins, because this creature is able to retain these rather than secrete them or excrete them, which would uh, be associated with a loss of water, makes them animals that have higher levels of toxins than otherwise. Uh, so, so a camel doesn't excrete very much? Well, it can, right. retain, it can retain toxic compounds to a higher level than other organisms. For example, if we go into a desert environment and uh, we are heat loaded, then we would have to sweat. The camel, to prevent water loss, does not sweat to the same extent as we would, and so it has the ability to actually have its temperature increase. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, again, is associated with less excretion, and therefore you have higher toxic loads. So that um, toxic urea then is dissipated through the flesh of the animal? Absolutely. If you take a horse, it doesn't have a split hoof. Now, a horse doesn't have a rumen like a cow has. So the digestion and fermentation, just as in the case of a rabbit, takes place at the end of the intestine. So in nature, horses are coprophagues, just like rabbits are coprophagues. Now, what's a coprophage? A coprophage is an organism that has to eat its own excreta. You see, the fermentation and the, the production of the bacteria now takes place at the end of the intestine, and 
the only way to absorb it would be to pass it back through the intestine. Now it can't put it into reverse peristalsis, so it goes the other route, and rabbits produce two kinds of feces. The one is a hard pellet, which is discarded, and the other one is the soft contents of the cecum, which is taken directly off the anus and recycled into the body. So it licks it back into its body. It licks it back into its body and re-ingests it. So this is like chewing the cud, eating what it ate before, except, of course, that it's gone the entire route now, which means that compounds like bile salts, secondary bile salts, all of those would be in there as well, and those tend to be carcinogenic. So these creatures are listed as unclean, and I think for very good reasons. Yeah. Well, what about the fish? say, take shark? Well, a shark is an animal that uh, is adapted to the marine environment, and the marine environment has a very high salt load. Uh, the concentration of the sea is normally about um, two-thirds higher than the salt concentration of fishes living in the ocean. And the shark it also has a lower salt content than the sea. Now, this is problematic. This means because the concentration in the ocean is higher than the concentration in the, in the shark, water by osmosis would tend to leave the shark and it would dehydrate. Like a dried up old prune. Or like a dried up old prune. Now, fish with fins and, and scales in the ocean, they solve this problem by drinking the water and then desalinating it through their, um, through their gills. They have special salt glands that excrete the salt, but the shark can't do that. It has a little salt gland at the end of the rectum where it gets rid of some of the salt, but in order to solve its water problem, it actually retains urea. So whereas the normally the animals get rid of the urea, this one retains it, and it has special reabsorption in the kidney to retain it to a very high level so that it actually has a higher osmotic concentration than the ocean by increasing the urea levels, and then it absorbs water by osmosis. Now that, of course, makes the, f the, the animal toxic. Mm -hmm. Urea is something that you wish to excrete, and we get rid of it through our kidneys on a daily basis, but the shark retains it. So uh, the old custom of taking shark fin soup is you cut off the shark fin, and they dried it, and basically the urea crystallizes. So what you have is a, like a tea bag of urea, and you reconstitute it by putting it into hot water, then basically you have a solution that is rich in urea, and there would be a lot cheaper ways of getting it than having shark fin soup. Like stock food, I guess. Yes, like stock food. Well, excuse, but of a, cubes of uh, stock food. Yes, but of a somewhat more distasteful <laughs> nature. <laughs> Well, th the reason I mention shark is because not only for the soup that many um, people l love, in fact, it's not only um, something which is obviously not so good for us, but it's the mo you're paying for it through the nose. Absolutely. Because it's a very, very expensive soup, you know, fa uh, shark fin soup. Very expensive. Uh, and also, people eat that in the general fish and ship, uh, chip uh, shop when you go down and buy uh, fish and chips very often the fish that is served is shark, which, uh, of course, uh, comes under the category of this uh, high toxic uh, fish. That's right. You know, in the past, they used to discard the rest of the shark and only use the fin. But since they have these freezing capabilities, they, they keep the shark because it tended to rot very easily. That's another feature about these unclean creatures. Now, those creatures also that are listed here as unclean that don't have scales. Yes. Those are normally scavengers. All the marine organisms that have either very loose scales or no scales fall into the category of scavenger or high carnivore. In other words, they feed off the highest trophic levels and have the highest accumulation of toxins. Let me ask about tuna. Yes. Well, Clean or unclean? Well, there's a lot of debate about the tuna. The tuna actually does have scales, but they're very loose. Now, an ultra-Orthodox Jew, I've been told by the professors working there in, in Israel on this issue, they say an ultra-Orthodox Jew will only eat a cultured fish if the scales are very firmly attached. 
So they actually have breeding programs where they breed fish with 12 or 13 scales. They also won't eat them if they don't have 12 scales at least. So that's just an interesting point. So if you can just rub the scales off, that would be considered by ultra-Orthodox as something mm. unclean. Although today that, that issue is very blurred and uh, is not taken as seriously as it might have been in the past. But personally, I would say being a high carnivore, it would be at a very high trophic level and have very high accumulation of environmental toxins. And that might be a reason why it could be considered unclean. So what you're saying is that there are re really three categories of fish. There are the unclean, then yes. there is this group like the tuna du dubious ones, that have yes. the sort of soft scales, and then you have yeah. the ones that have the real scales, That's right. which or are considered to be clean. And then you have those that have no scales, like uh, catfish and uh, rockfish, which are scavengers, and they would have very high levels of accumulated toxins owing to accumulation up the food scale. Just while we're dealing with the seafoods, another delicacy around the world is, uh, you know, sea fish like mussels and lobsters and crayfish yes. and, uh, and oysters. All of these are looked upon as being, you know, the, the, the luxury of the luxury. That's right. What's your comment upon those? Well, all of those are basically filter feeders. And uh, we all know that if a red tide comes along, there you have certain microorganisms in the ocean like the dinoflagellates, which have toxins which can be lethal. And since these are then just filtered by these organisms as food organisms, these toxins accumulate in those creatures and uh, are highly detrimental and even lethal. So warnings go out when the levels are very high, mm -hmm. but at any other stage, these toxins would be in those organisms as well, and it would be best rather not to eat them. So I think it's a very wise um, rule that these organisms should not be eaten. Let's come on to the animals now. Um, pig meat. Yes. What is, what's your comment upon the, uh, well the, the pig? the pig is considered unclean. Now, the pig is a scavenger. It'll eat anything that under the sun. And as a consequence, the pig has very high levels of toxins in it, number one. Plus, it is very prone to parasites. Now, today they will tell you, well, we can solve that with medication. We can get rid of the parasites and the trichinosis and the tapeworms are no longer a problem with the modern dosing techniques. But it's interesting that uh, the toxins in fish, uh, in, in pigs, have a, have a particular name. They're called toxins because the pigs belong to the family Sudidae. And these toxins, many people are allergic to them. So urticaria and uh, you know, skin problems, many people experience them when they eat pork. So those are other reasons why pork should perhaps be avoided. And then there's one other interesting one. The pig, being physiologically very close to the human, has the capacity to harbor viruses which are pathogenic to humans. And in the past, when animals had viruses, these viruses and their dissociated diseases weren't readily passed on to humans. But they could incubate and change genetically or gain genetic change over time within a pig so the pig acted like an incubator and then become pathogenic to humans it's interesting that in today's age that barrier seems to be breaking down and with the latest bird flu that we have where in asia these people had a 50 percent chance of dying from the bird flu we've actually skipped the transition and we can go directly from birds to humans now but the pig has always been a harborer of this mechanism of transmutating and making a disease available to humans. So the pig has always been a problem, either in terms of its toxins, its allergens, its uh, parasites, or its ability to harbor pathogenic organisms. Like How do you viruses. deal with the argument that some say that uh, our pigs are fed on good, clean food and they're housed in good clean environment that this makes the pig clean nothing that you can feed a pig no way in which you can treat it can change the way in which a virus will get into that organism why is it that the medical world is now banning for example transplant of plants of heart valves from pigs to humans because of the encephalitic viruses which are 
in that material. And encephalitis uh, is an outbreak that you had in Malaysia, for example, where many farmers got it, and it's direct from the pig to the human. And you, you cannot prevent that, even in the cleanest environments. You will not prevent that. What about the argument, though, that by cooking, you destroy these viruses and so forth, that uh, if you, as long as you cook the food well? Well, that is true. If you cook food well, then you will kill most of the bacteria or all of them, and you will get rid of the viral problem. But the organisms that live in those organisms have a metabolism as well. And they produce compounds which accumulate in those animals, and you will not get rid of those compounds. So you'll still have the secondary compounds. You know, if you look at the biblical uh, stories about clean and unclean animals, rodents, for example, they all fall into the category of uh, hares, rabbits. They're all coprophagues. That means they eat their own excreta. They have the same problem. Uh, the Bible says if one of them falls onto seed, and that seed is then uh, comes into contact with water, then that seed should not be used. It's unclean, mm -hmm. which is fascinating. Now, some years ago, they did experiments where they took plants, uh, young seedlings, and they made extracts of the meat of clean and unclean animals and used it as a fertilizer. And it's interesting that those that received unclean extracts mm -hmm were growth impaired. They had what they called a phytotoxic index, and they were more growth impaired than when they got extracts of clean animals. So now, these compounds are often carcinogenic that you find in animal products, like the benzopyrenes, and some of these are actually carcinogenic. So if these accumulate into the seed through water, then the growth could be impaired. The genetics could be altered by different activation of the gene system so that the product might not be as fit for human consumption as it might have been before. So there are very good reasons for that. It's also interesting that if an animal like that fell into an earthen vessel or into a clay oven, then those, those had to be discarded. Now the same applies there. An earthen vessel or a a clay oven is very porous mm. and absorbs these volatile substances. If you heat that oven, those volatiles are released, come back into the food, and some of them can act as carcinogens. So I think it's a very wise conjunction that those should be discarded. What about also the argument of the abattoirs, that the uh, inspectors would be able to pick up any parasites or any worms and so forth that the animal had, and they would then discard the carcass? Well, I've worked with abattoirs uh, a lot of my life. I've done a lot of research at abattoirs. We worked on antibiotic resistance, and we, we did a lot of work in abattoirs. I've spoken to a lot of the inspectors. These animals come through on a very fast basis, and they open it up. They take slices of the liver. They look for parasites. And you'll be surprised at the level of parasitology that we find in abattoirs today. And uh, yes, most of these pass through, but there has to be a fairly high level before something is discarded for human consumption. An organism that, for example, has parasites of a low dose in the liver, the organism itself would still be used, the liver would be discarded. But what would be effect, the effect of those parasites on the organism? Plus, then you have the fact that most of the people that actually do the inspections and work with the meat all the time are also exposed to these things and they suffer frequently from diseases like brucellosis and other uh, diseases that are transmitted from these animals to them. So, yes, interesting, but a lot of the things pass through anyway. What do you think then um, is the ideal diet that um, God would be suggesting that we have? Well, if you look at the, the original diet, we find it in Genesis chapter 1, where God says, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree with fruit on it, and it shall be yours for food. And then when the sin factor came in and the, the earth was cursed, God added the plants of the field, which are basically the vegetables. So the closer you can get to the ideal original diet, the closer you will 
B, to a diet that will provide the nutrients you need, provided you have a very broad base. If you have a, a narrow, restricted diet, then you could suffer from uh, problems that you don't have all the nutrients, all the necessary amino acids, or all the necessary uh, minerals and vitamins. So a broad-based, plant-based diet would be the healthiest that you could have. And vegetarians are known to live longer, to have uh, fewer debilitating diseases and secondary diseases than non-vegetarians. I mean, science has backed this up. The World Health Organization published a whole thick extract of a World Congress on vegetarian diet versus non-vegetarian diet and showed conclusively that the vegetarian diet is definitely the healthier way to go. Well, of course, after the flood, vegetables were added. Do you think that that's an important part of our diet too? Well, before the flood, they were added. After sin, they were added. Mm -hmm. After the flood, meat Correct. was added. And, uh, well, do we, do we need meat? We don't need it if we have a variety of plants. If you had a restricted diet and you only ate one type of, of legume, for example, then you would have amino acid shortages. But if you combine grains and legumes, uh, then you would have a complete uh, diet in terms of your protein as well. Well, it seems to me, Professor, that um, there's some very good reasons why God has asked us not to eat certain foods. Yes, I think there are. And uh, even medical science is, is giving us encouragement today to be obedient to uh, that original diet. Well, thank you very much for uh, being with us today. I, it's been most informative, and I'm sure our viewers today have learned a tremendous amount about the physiology of animals and why perhaps God, at least some reasons why God has given us this instruction. I'm not sure that we know everything about it. No, definitely not. But at least God has given us enough evidence to encourage our faith. Thank well, thank you again for joining us in our program today, Life After Life. And uh, I would want to encourage you to go back and to have confidence in God's Word. And even after all of these years, since God first created Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, today we can still have confidence that the information that He gave applies even under the microscope of modern science. May God bless you as you continue to study.